today's session, which is accelerating e-government and rapidly transitioning government services online, trial successes and lessons. So we have an extremely high powered panel today um, from all parts of the Caribbean. Um, Bennett Thomas from the government of Dominica, the director of telecommunications and technology. We have Mr. Rodney Taylor, who is the director of data processing and ministry of um, science, I think it's technology and innovation in Barbados and Maurice Barnes from the government of Jamaica, um, Eagle of Jamaica. So we have three panelists this morning and just to start everyone off, the first thing I would probably like to say is that as everyone knows, the, the pandemic has created a, a real shift in thinking in many of the regional governments where digital government or e-government was seen as perhaps not as a high priority in, in many um, jurisdictions. Um, I believe that shift has happened and many prime ministers and, and government leaders are now talking about government services online, um, ensuring that you have contactless um, service delivery, um, e-payments, the whole, the whole nine yards as a, a driver towards the recovery of um, the various economies in the region, which have been, many of them have been challenged and in some cases decimated by the pandemic, especially those which are, um, you know, focused or, or reliant on tourism as one of the um, pillars of, of um, economic success. And to do that, um, this digital recovery that we are talking about is something I think that everyone is interested in. And it's, it's from a standpoint of where we sit as a region and for someone who's been practicing in this industry for some time, I think we're very happy um, given the, you know, the challenges we're facing to see at least that this is one positive bright spark that's coming out of it. We've all talked about moving our meetings online, yes, but there's also a heavy emphasis on online education and governments are now, I think, grappling with trying to find a way to support their, their education system and getting um, devices and access, moving that online. And in addition, government services, which have been slow to come online in many jurisdictions are now being accelerated. So to have that discussion this morning, I would first like to turn you over to um, any order that's on the agenda. Um, Mr. Bennett Thomas, Commonwealth of Dominica, Director of Tele Telecommunications and Technology. So Bennett, if you're ready to go, um, I'll hand over to you. Bennett, you may be on mute. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes Bennett. Yes, Go ahead, Bennett. All right, so once again, let me just say thanks for being here. And um, what I want to do this morning is just to give us uh, some feedback as to what we are doing here in Dominica in line of e government. And as Tracy has rightly said, um, what COVID has done is basically to expose in some extent, the weaknesses of our systems, but at the same time, accelerate the whole idea of ICT in government and, and the use of ICT to facilitate what we are now facing. And um, so what I'm gonna do is basically just to give us a, a quick overview of the trajectory that we have taken in Dominica in, in terms of e-government, what we have done and what we are now moving forward into not because of COVID, but just to complement what COVID has done. So uh, as it says, they're accelerating a government rapidly, transition into a government services online. What in Dominica's case, our journey began sometime in 2007, when there was a, an EDU funded project to create greater efficiency in the delivery of government services to the public. And they, they, we saw that as using ICT tools 
and a special ministry unit was formed called the ICT unit within the what we call the establishment personnel and training department. And what we found out is that uh, a number of government services they were kind of fragmented, and there was a need to create greater efficiencies. The, the way of doing business in government was totally uh, inefficient. You, know, you had people moving all around. If you were to do something from one ministry, we have different buildings around. You have to move from one building to the next to do a basic, basic services. And so we decided, well, the best way to do that to alleviate some of those issues is to use some ICT tools, which were already available, but we are not utilizing it. So that project seek to create greater efficiency within the public service. But I would like to highlight the fact that if, if we are going to do that, as we have done, there has to be a proper infrastructure. And there have been all in the bells and whistles and applications that we have been putting forward. That's, that's simple. Um, the key to getting this process going is to have a very solid and reliable infrastructure. Because if you don't, you're going to have problems because nothing will work. So. Uh, the, the ICT unit came up and they, they, they established a government portal uh, where the various ministries, uh, each person have their content, each ministry had their content. And lower down in the service there, you will see, for example, I have here the whole issue of um, we allowed a service provider. In that case, at the time, when we began that project, it was cable and wireless, and the, a contract was signed with them to provide the government infrastructure to facilitate these online services. And um, it, it created fiber. We had to put fiber at every government institution. And as I said, the infrastructure is critical. So we had fiber at schools, at hospitals, health clinics, police stations. There was a customs application called a secure network. Uh, I will talk about that later. Uh, and subsequent to that, sometime in 2018, we had another country, um, uh, RFP sent out a request for proposal. And um, in that case, um, the DCL won the contract. And we decided to have a very robust infrastructure following the, the damage caused by Hurricane uh, Maria, uh, Maria. I mean, as you know, Dominica was severely battered by that hurricane. And in a sense, it was something like a, a new experience with basically starting from scratch. And in that sense, we could come up with something better, uh, a better rebuild, as, as in, in the, uh, what we call building back better. So in the new proposal that we put forward to facilitate this whole online uh, ecosystem, we found out that, look, if we lose the fiber, then what happens? So we had to put an infrastructure in place, which is critical, as I said, with some level of redundancy and so forth. So we had in the new proposal, we had a multi-layered system comprising both underground and overhead fiber. Overhead, because of the topography of Dominica, we have certain areas that are very engineering challenge. So we had underground fiber in the new infrastructure. We have overhead fiber. We have air fiber, which is a kind of microwave type technology. We have two data centers. We have 21 VSATs, and we also have cloud services. So we have tried to put a very robust system in place to so should we lose anything. And I think on um, that process, uh, and we say with humility too, that we in the Caribbean must understand that we are in a very vulnerable area in terms of the hurricanes and even earthquakes. And we have to put infrastructure in place to ensure that if we are to lose one form, then there is something as a backup. And I think that is very critical for all of us because the, what we are seeking to do is to have the system resilient enough so that even if we lose something during the hurricane, if we lose the fiber, then we can, do, we can continue to have certain basic services to run the country. So um, while I have said this, um, interestingly, uh, we didn't do sometime in 20, or I think it was 2819, uh, some of you must have heard of the, the World Bank project. There's a World Bank 
uh, what you could call it the Caribbean Digital Transformation Project, which is seeking to transform the economies of the Caribbean into a fully digitized environment. And they, they have it as a CARICOM initiative. However, they began with four islands, the OECS, and those four islands comprise Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, and St. Kitts, St. Nevis. And for, I don't know if most persons are unaware of it, but that project seeks to transform the en entire um, ecosystem digitally in the Caribbean so we can move to a more digital environment. And there is both a, a, a country aspect to it in terms of each country, but there are also regional aspects where regional agencies like the CTU, um, Excel, um, Impact for cybersecurity Security and so forth, the Central Bank, ECCB, this is the monetary aspect of it, Excel, this is telecom regulation and so forth. Um, I believe um, CTU deals with the CARICOM in terms of the ICE common ICT space. Uh, so there are regional components, impact deals with cybersecurity for the region, but it's more like a spoken wheel configuration. So you have a regional entity as, and then there will be the local entities to island that is linked back to the regional structure. If you need more information, I can give you one. But that is, that's, is an alignment of the whole process of how do we move forward in the region in terms of a digitalized environment. And um, I took a note here from the World Bank document that says the digital e-government, the government infrastructure platforms and services, that's one of the key components of the World Bank project, which relates to e-government. And this component, they say, will support public sector modernization resilience and delivery of digital public services to individuals and businesses. So that's the main frame here. And as it's noticed here in the bullet point, it says it will aim to ensure that the core infrastructure, platforms, institutions, and human capacity need to efficiently and effectively manage internal government operations and to build on these core enablers to make public services widely accessible online from anywhere in the, the country, the region, and across the globe. So that is the key to the entire process in terms of the e-government modernization. And I believe my, my vision is that if we do that individually in our countries and then link it to the common ICT space, then I can stay in Dominica and easily buy something online in Jamaica or in Trinidad and Lucia. And as I go down for that process, with that, um, you will see the whole issue of the a common digital ID is critical to move that, says, that process forward. And that is also one of the activities within the World Bank project, which is something we too had already processed in, in Dominica. Um, I, I, I just want to say, okay, it will also prepare the region's government for deeper interconnectivity and interoperability of data and information systems across borders to smooth administration of regional trade immigration and other services between countries. So that is key. Once we have put that necessary infrastructure in place and we do it properly, then I see a common ICT space within the region where we can easily do certain things. I saw, for example, I saw something from Jamaica where some gentleman, an engineer, opened something up for, for a, co a common platform. There's a young guy in Dominica who is opening up something, shop DM that, 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 that store. And there's another, uh, I, another guy, I think, from St. Vincent. They are all coming together. And I think what needs to be done, I, there seems to be a, some kind of fractional way, on, fragmented way of doing things in the region. If everybody seems to be having their own little silos. We need to come together as a team and see how we can put this system in place as a, a harmonized system so we can easily move from one country to the next and don't allow water and land to, to block us from having a proper trade. Um, just to run down quickly to give you some examples of what we have already. Prior to the COVID, we had some things that we had here on e-government in Dominica. Uh, the drivers and the, what do you call it, drivers and automobile information system, which is a database that are access where drivers and vehicle insurance information are stored. So you can easily use that uh, if you want to pay your, 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 your driver's license, you're automatically checked. You're, and if you're going to pay the license, then you have to pay your insurance. And that's how we are collecting government revenue very quickly because 
some guys might get an ICP to have their license paid, but don't pay their insurance. So we have a database where you can easily access to do that, and we call it a driver's and automotive information system. There is also a financial information unit for e-filing, and that eliminates the need for paper filing of suspicious transaction reporting, more like a cybersecurity database so we can begin to look. We have something like FIU, which is the Financial Information Unit, and they look at all kind of, of issues of file suspicious transactions in the, in the process. We have an app for that. There is a mobile salary app, and that goes for your salary. salary. You can automatically check your salary online in the government system and so forth. There yeah, are necessary uh, protocols in place. We have a, a, a single point of reference for all staff include the, with forms and announcements and scholarships and job services in the government and we, we call that platform the GovNet. And so you can go there and all public servants can easily have access to that information. Uh, one of the things that we, okay, I'll come to that in, uh, soon. Uh, we have a tax and e-filing system where you can go, to, uh, you can file your, your taxes online and pay government. So you have a form of collecting revenue for government. You can simply log in, go in put, put your filing, fill up your tax forms and pay your money online. Uh, there's a human, uh, human resource management information system where we have all persons in the public service, their, their, their names, their IDs, their positions, and that kind of thing, so you can easily access that. There's an educational management information system, we call it EMIS, and that is where the teachers, and the more administrative in its operation, where the, the school system, ministry of education, can look at all the classes and students and so forth, look at um, their, their homeworks, look at their reports, cards, etc. All this can be is done online. There's a civil registry system brought in there where you have marriages and registry and death certificates, uh, all civil registry data and in the issue on some secure certificates. Uh, quickly, we have an employee portal that provides a single point of reference to review salary statements and so forth. You can do your, what we call your EADRs, your, your employee assessment and development review. You have your leave forms, etc. All that is online. The, the employees can, can do that. There's an online business registry. It's a one-stop shop for business registration, including social security registration, commercial registry, and operating licenses and tax. Uh, there are others, there's a fisheries one also for the fishing folks. Uh, quickly, there's a connect to government application. It's an application to improve the efficiency of calls to the, to the customer service representative. Uh, it takes, uh, makes available to the customer service representative answers to frequently asked questions of government for greater efficiency and that kind of thing. Uh, there's a Domi node, which is a customized implementation of the Geo node. It's a web-based application and platform for developing geospatial information systems and for deploying the, the spatial data infrastructures and, and so forth. Uh, I, quickly here, we have um, a, a mobile app for telephone, the tele, internal telephone directory in government. There is a GovEDU, it's a two-part system where assistance is applied to online and track miniature education and human stuff. I talk about the FIU, there's a prison management system. There is a, a, a commerce assistance application for small business to track the unstored data. We talk about the drivers, there's a suspicious thing, there's electronic filing. Uh, we have a multi-purpose identification system. I put a note here in red because we are seeking to update that because what this multi-purpose identification system basically is, is a one card, the one um, ID system where you can use it for health, for shopping, for voting, etc. In, in Dominator's case, I mean, uh, what happened is that there was an e-grip program running for the region, the OECS, and somehow it was it was being managed by, you know, I think there was a Freecom as a, as a manufacturer. They went up, out of business because of bankruptcy and because of that, that system got held back a bit. So what happened now, this multi-purpose identification system was planning to ensure that I could go to St. Lucia, for example, with my ID, my digital ID, and um, do a shop, some shopping down there. And it is easily identified that I'm from Dominica and I make my payment, et cetera, and that kind of thing. 
I could do this for social security, I can do it for my health, I can do it for paying taxes, I can come to the airport. One system, one system. However, with the, with the, with the issue of free term going into bankruptcy, uh, the government here, we decided we big, uh, big, they wanted to use it also for voter identification for, for the elections. And because this thing was off, they came up with a, with a new system for just for voting, but is able to be, uh, it is backward compatible to this system. So interestingly, we, we have not in, instituted it, but it's, a, it's something that's going to be done. Uh, while we were working on the MPID system, the OECS came up and said, okay, let's see how we can do this in a, in a more harmonized way. And as a result, we came up, they, they call it the OECS ID. And uh, so the OECS is also looking at that whole process of a common digital ID. And instead of having it in Dominica and so forth, but Dominica has been leading that ID system. So we are working with the OECS desk to ensure that we have a common ID among the island. And that is fundamental for the whole e-government service because we need to have a common ID to us be able to access all this information. Uh, I have uh, the work, in fact, I put in the World Bank project here, also has digital ID, and um, so we are going to just amalgamate them into one. And as we have told the World Bank personnel, critical to this whole e government infrastructure is a digital ID. And we have a document management system that we're working on, and we had something called Prestis, which I believe is kind of outdated. And so we are looking at either using NewGen or Alfresco to do the same and much more of this document management system. I, I remember clearly that you have to do too much, there is too much paper, we're looking for a paperless office. And um, using the NewGen or Alfresco services, we can get from point A to point B. I mean, sometimes it, it, the ease of doing business in this country is crazy. So you find that uh, if I were to get something on the, on the port and somebody send me something via by a port. I mean, I take an entire day off from my work to just to get what to a, a simple barrel or something. And a lot of the documentation is online, but we have not utilized that service. So this entire document management system with electronic signature and everything can be done. And then when I leave my office, in hopefully within two minutes, three minutes, I should be able to get my, my stuff. So that's what we are seeking to do with this entire process of document management. We spoke about the civil registry system, and I think for here, for now, I will stop here and entertain any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much, Bennett. That was extremely interesting, and um, I'm keen to understand, especially your digital ID project. Um, that's perhaps going to be rolled out throughout the OECS, how that will work. Um, that's something that other countries I've been talking um, a lot about and something that um, as many of us are aware of, that has been discussed ever since the, the 2000s, um, trying to find a single identifier and some approach to unifying all these numbers that we have in the region for our various um, transactional services that need to be placed online. So that's a, one of the projects in particular we keep a keen eye on it and it's really impressive to see what Dominic is doing, especially as, a, as one of the smaller of, of the islands. Um, and I think the OECS has been one of the leaders in the region in terms of driving e-government um, through their um, environments and even harmonizing legislation and services. Um, tax filing is one of them. I know is something that um, has been harmonized throughout many of the OECS countries. Um, so an excellent presentation. Um, I did see a question in the chat coming in from Glenn McKnight. Um, he's, he was asking if um, a COVID-19 tracking system was implemented um, as part of the, the response to the pandemic. A minute, is that something that you could speak to, whether there was a, a COVID-19 um, tracking system implemented? There is something that we have done, not not in the sense of uh, not in the sense of an application per se, but there has been 
a number of online systems put in place. Um, your if your application, how do you come into the country? Uh, there have not been anything dealing with, okay, tracking somebody like using your cell phone or that kind of thing as yet. But there are a number of processes that the Ministry of Health has put in place, certain protocols on what, what can you do as when somebody, what, what, what can you do when somebody is, um, until you come to the country, uh, what the forms you have to fill out. For example, my, my son had to travel back to, to Jamaica. And uh, the amount of things he had to do before he had to, to move out. And that is a, a number of online services were in place. Uh, but to track whether a person has COVID, we, we have not done it to see on, a, on, a, on an app. Although I, I, I think there's something going on on that area. But if you have COVID-19, there's an ongoing process of, of tracking persons and doing testing and PCR tests, et cetera. And we, 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 we tend to be very, very strict on that. As you know, in Dominica, we, we have how much? There are 20 cases and 18 of them has been uh, has, has revived and two of them are now under quarantine. So um, basically, I think we are doing well. But um, the tracking system, they have a very robust system in place. But in, I believe uh, I can get update information for you as to whether there is an actual application to, to help track those things. Right. Thank you very much, Bennett. Um, that's, again, it might be interesting to hear from others later on whether uh, other countries have implemented something in response to COVID-19. Um, there are a couple other questions in response to this presentation. Um, Judith Hellestein is asking, um, who makes your document management system? And a related question, um, maybe not exactly related, but um, um, Deirdre, Deirdre Williams, she is asking if there is a need for a clearinghouse. Well, she's not asking, she's suggesting that there may be a need for a clearinghouse or a database to share projects and plans, um, I guess, in the region as far as possible. And she's asking if that um, they shared database or clearinghouse of what's, what's happening is available already in the OECS, and I guess whether CARICOM itself has established something of that nature. Um, Bennett, maybe you could take the OECS part of it and, and answer the two questions. One, remember the who makes your DMs as document management system and whether or not there's a clearinghouse for OECS projects and plans. Yeah, well, um, first of all, with respect to um, the, with respect to the, document management system, as I said, they have one in place now and it's called Questis, which I, and I think that's an old time, I, my personal view is that it, it, it's not as robust as required. So remember Questis, I did a research on the old process and I found out that Questis is not among the top. And so what we are doing now is seeking to see if we can work with new gen technologies as well as um, and Fresco to do our document management system. So that's the two players that we're looking at. Although there, there are others who have come on board and so forth, like Microsoft and so forth, but I think we're looking at NewGen and, and Alfresco. In terms of the database and access, that is one of the problems we are having. The problem is, as I said earlier, there is too much of a fragmented approach to this process. And that is what, what that we're seeing, what we're looking forward to. Um, the, from the OECS standpoint, I had a meeting, a, a, a short discussion with Dr. Jules, uh, in fact, last week. And if you look at the, the history of the CARICOM and OECS, you'll find out that OECS has done much more in terms of implementation of those services than CARICOM. And I, I dare say that CARICOM spent too much time talking. And every time you go to the meeting, you get the same talk. In the OECS, you, um, there, has, there has more an implementation aspect. So, so things are happening in the OECS. And I believe what should be done is that we should use the OECS model and expand it for CARICOM because a lot of the work that we are doing, um, Dr. Jules, for example, informed me, for example, the Ministry of Education, he has been trying to get the, the, the OECS countries, some of them have joined on board, 
to have a common procurement system and that can be accessed, accessed by all the countries. So say, for example, Dominica needs um, 200 devices for students. Instead of I, I need 200, Grenada need 500, and this one need two, uh, 200, and, and St. Vincent need five, another 100. Each of us go and spend millions of dollars to get this information. When there is a common platform, I can call it um, Easy Buy or something like that, and you go on board, you put, you consolidate, and say, okay, for the OECS, we have 10,000 um, devices we need. You place that 10,000 on the, on the on the common platform, and it's there already. And there are it's a reverse auditing, um, uh, a reverse system of of um, when you put the system in on board, you put all the books on board, all your devices on board, and manufacturers come in and say, oh, okay, I'll pay ten dollars. I can give you ten dollars for the for that portion. Another one comes and and, and bet against it and say, oh, I can give you eight dollars for this one. So in the end, by by the time you finish this entire process, you you would have spent, you'd have saved significant quantities of money because of the volume. That is being done, and, I, and to answer that question, we need to have that common and harmonized way of doing things in that new environment. If we are to have a, for, for a better, a better relationship, as well as to cut down costs, uh, and the issue of using um, AI for procurement is, is critical. We need to have a common procurement policy to ensure that we do it properly, and. That's what has to be done. And I think the OECS already has begun that process. Thank you very much, Bennett. And I'm seeing a whole um, discussion starting up in the chat and putting additional questions. Um, perhaps we could move the questions to the latter part of the session, because I do want to give our other panelists um, a time slot. Or maybe, Bennett, maybe you could respond in the chat to some specific questions that are coming in for you. Um, okay. so, what we can do is now move on and once we can get, if this chat holds up, we can get um, to the additional questions at the end if we have the additional time. Um, Rodney Taylor from Director, of, well, from Barbados, Government of Barbados, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, I believe. Um, Rodney can correct me, Smart Technology, right, correct, thank you. Um, Rodney, um, Director of Data Processing, um, I know Rodney very well, a colleague of mine. He used to, um, from way back in the IGF and the CTU, he was involved in CTU and the Commonwealth um, Secretariat. Rodney, welcome and over to you. Rodney, I think you might be on mute. Okay, good morning all. Um, thank you, Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, good morning all. Start my video. Let's start your video. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let me just go back a bit. <laughs> Sorry. All right. And can you see the presentation as well? Yes, we can. Okay, brilliant. I want to thank um, Bennett for the wonderful presentation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, thank CTU for inviting us to be a part of this discussion about accelerating e-government, and that is certainly what is going on, <clears throat> uh, in particular since COVID. Uh, very interesting point made by Bennett, in, in, even in relation to CARICOM versus OECD and what is happening in terms of discussion versus implementation, and um, I fully support uh, the points that he has made and some of the chat uh, questions and comments being placed in the chat are very relevant in terms of a regional procurement and collaboration framework. I'm going to talk very briefly today about what is happening in Barbados. Um, I'm, I'll make it very uh, precise. I'll give a few examples of some of the projects that we're working on. It's not exhaustive by any means. A lot of what uh, Bennett presented, we're also doing in terms of digital ID and the public sector modernization uh, loan from the IDB. And I'll touch on that briefly and uh, just give you a few examples and identify some lessons learned. So the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Smart Technology, or MIST, as we, as we call it, um, was established since the new administration took uh, office in 2018. And it was established to lead Barbados' digital transformation. So prior to this, 
there were a number of agencies that were established um, to do different things, different aspects of IT and digital digitization. But it was very disjointed. You, know, you had the e-government development unit, National Council for Science and Technology, the data processing department. Um, and so the new administration merged them into one ministry with a very sharp focus on implementing and driving digital transformation, not just in the public sector, but nationally. Uh, and so um, it was established, it's being headed by uh, Senator the Honorable Kay McConney, who is also, of course, participates in the CTU regional uh, initi uh, meetings. And um, the, our mission is to, we've adopted a mission called EASE, which is to make public services easy, accessible, or sorry, easy, affordable, safe, and efficient. Um, and that is what we're trying to do in a digital context. And while we have amalgamated all of the different government departments, our move now is really is to streamline the new ministry and the structure that breaks down those silos of different departments so that we are able to deliver services more efficiently. Uh, our mandate is born out of the government's manifesto, which is one of the policy statements that we fall under is to build a strong economy, all right? Building the best Barbados together. And the digitization uh, projects are aimed to build new economic planks for growth and development. Uh, okay, she requested, okay. <laughs> all right, so uh, digitized government and Barbados is one of the, one of the key Okay, thank you very much for that <laughs> initiatives. Okay, so uh, as Bennett pointed out, we are also beneficiaries of an IDB loan of US $40 million. And I've, I've shared the link in the subsequent slide and I've also posted it in the chat to provide you with more details on what that project involves. Um, there are two main objectives, to, to drive government digital transformation and service quality improvement uh, we know that this is being driven by all of the advances in technology. Our citizens now are accustomed to buying things online. They look at Amazon and Google and wonder why is government so efficient? And the CTU has an initiative called 21st Century Government. And, and that is just it. Why is everyone else so innovative and transformative? And why is government still requiring its citizens to show up at five o'clock in the morning in order to get a spot in the line to apply for a service and to pay in cash and to you know, close at three o'clock because the cashier is closed. So there's a recognition that in this context, um, you know, government itself needs to be more innovative in how it delivers services. It needs to be more citizen centric and understand and respond to the needs of its citizens. The second objective is to enhance HR management in the public sector. And so the Ministry of the Public Service is a beneficiary of this loan to implement more efficient HR management systems. Of course, people drive um, processes. And if you want to, to transform the public service, you have to transform people as well. And so HR management in terms of performance management um, and in building capacity within the public service and to transition to a digital uh, delivery model, um, that is part of the, the uh, objective of the IDB loan. It also aims to achieve greater use of digital channels by individuals and companies across the public service. And Bennett spoke to this in his uh, presentation because the projects are pr pretty much aligned. I won't go into all of this and then the presentation will be made available. And that's why I put the information here, not necessarily to present, but for you to be able to access it after. But digital ID is one of the key components as well. And we've started uh, implementing that project. And we actually, signed on to a CTU initiative to establish a common framework um, within the region for digital identities. Because ideally, you want to be able to move from one country to the next with your smart ID card or your digital identity uh, and be able to open a bank account, start a business without having to produce proof of address or bank statements and stuff like that. So that it can certainly facilitate inter-regional transactions. All right, and we also actually have already implemented the electronic documents and records management system 
That's done. And our next uh, task we're working on now is the implementation of an e-services platform uh, that is based on an interoperability framework, which basically means that it allows one government department to share data with another government department so the citizen doesn't have to produce a document from one that was given to them by one government department because that department already has access. <laughs> um, and this is a system that is based on the X roads, which is Estonia's um, developed model of uh, interoperability. So as I mentioned, integrated government digital databases, uh, you can't digitize a paper, well, you, you can't digitize if everything is based on paper. And there are still several government departments, as I'm sure this is the case throughout the region, that there are lots of systems that are still paper-based. And uh, you have to create a digital database, at least which provides you with something to connect to an interoperability framework. So the digitization of those records have started. We've started digitizing things like police records, criminal records because the application for police certificate of character, which we'll talk about later, is one of the uh, services that we made available um, in, in short order. Um, <clears throat> is a, a modern e-governance model is a component-based service, service model along the establishment of public services by reusing as much as possible existing service components. And that's what I spoke to about a sort of once only um, I think different countries call it, you know, different things, but, you know, I, I should never ask you as a citizen to produce a document from ministry or from the registration department because I have access to it. And therefore, once I can establish your identity, then everything else should connect on the back end as a, as a public service. If we're delivering digitally, this is what we need to do. So to require, okay, my ID, I need to take my birth certificate and I need to take my passport and I need to take that. But why? Because government already has access to it in a much more secure and trusted environment. And therefore, this is what we are trying to achieve. And of course, digital payments is critical because you can apply all you want. But if I still have to go to an office to pay between eight and four, then it's not really a true end-to-end -end digital service. And this is just a conceptual model, which outlines what I've just spoken about that you can look at after, uh, but it involves electronic databases, a secure data exchange and a service portal. So in our case, that's gov.pb. Uh, that is being transitioned. That will also be upgraded within the next two months or so. And every single government service would be, service would be accessible via that portal. So I'm not gonna send you to Ministry of Agriculture's website, and Ministry of Tourism and Ministry of, of Business, you're going to go to gov.bb and you select the service you want. It's citizen-centric. You don't necessarily need to know which government department is offering this. You just need to know that this is the portal for government services. Um, so I'll just go into a few examples. We've launched Easy Pay Plus 2019. I think it was around September. These are some of the things you can go on to the Easy Pay portal and pay for. You can pay your land tax if you're a professional, such as a lawyer, an architect, and so on. You need to pay annual fees to maintain your, your license. You can do that there, the official gazette, which um, indicates when laws are passed and so on. Uh, one that we've launched just last week is the renewal of your driver's license. And this one is very interesting because, I mean, since less than seven days, we have just over 500 people uh, subscribing to it and renewing their licenses that way. And we have partnered with the Barbados Postal Service so that that license can also be delivered to your door via registered mail. So you apply, you pay, it's delivered to you within three days. Uh, we retake the old license back and uh, give you the new one. This is particularly useful in the context of COVID because there were people who actually reached out to me to say, look, we can't even renew our driver's license. And for poor for people who need a driver's license even to conduct a job, uh, ambulance drivers and people like those, uh, they had issues because they could not get their driver's license renewed. And this has addressed that. Um, we also established uh, uh, forms.gov.bb, which is a, a, a sort of a stopgap measure until the e full e-services platform is ready, but uh, allowed us to deliver very simply um, using a forms um, sort of infrastructure, sort of like Google Forms, but it's not Google. <laughs> um, 
it allows you us to do things like the police certificate of character. So you can go to forms up, provided the link there, you can see what services are available. This also was a bugbear police certificate of character to get an appointment required. It took weeks. It took weeks. Uh, and of course, in a COVID context, it would have, that would have extended even more. Fortunately, this was implemented before COVID. Uh, and this is a problem because you need police certificates of character for many jobs, uh, for if you're a security officer, if you're working on cruise ships. And there are people who in the past have lost out on jobs because they simply could not get a police certificate of character. Um, but this now is fully online. You apply, you pay, uh, and it is sent to you by email. So it's really transformational. Um, you've heard perhaps about the Barbados Welcome Stamp, which allows people to come to try to take advantage of this COVID issue and the fact that the, as a region, we have responded really well to the, to the pandemic. Uh, our cases are much lower than much of the developed countries, such as the US and the UK. And uh, I think we need to credit our leadership and uh, the fact that we as a people have been compliant with respect to the protocols being issued by the Ministry of Health. And so we're encouraging people, as I'm sure many Caribbean countries are, encouraging people to come to Barbados and come to the region to work remotely. Uh, I think certain, if you look at value for money, um, you, can, you can pay a lot less in Barbados, in Trinidad, in St. Vincent, and Dominica, enjoy the lovely uh, weather, enjoy the good infrastructure, the fiber, there's connectivity in the region, uh, that rivals connectivity in the UK, the USA, et cetera. So this is a service that we launched just within the last few weeks and have received an overwhelming response from people all over the world. Uh, the, the online immigration customs form is also something we did in, work, in partnership with the GRCC, Joint Regional Commands, Command Center. And I think this is something that, um, that the intention is to roll out across the region. So instead of filling that paper form, that entry departure form, you can go online, um, I think it's travelform.gov.bb, choose A or C, fill in your details, submit your biodata page, um, and um, you gain entry, you clear, you're clear three days, I think it is before, before entry into the island, that negates the need to have a paper form to deal with kiosks, uh, and to have to, you know, it, it is to reduce the level of contact and so on. So this has been very useful, and. We've also required people to submit uh, a negative PCR tests in relation to COVID um, before they come or be subject to a test on arrival. So this is one of the measures that helps us to mitigate against the importation of COVID cases. Uh, this is just part of the back end that gives us a daily reporting on what revenues are being received. Uh, we can break this down very in a very granular level by ministry, department, by service, and so on. So the analytics in terms of what people are paying for, how they're paying, whether it's credit card, debit card, mobile money, uh, because we do have a service in Barbados called um, M Money. And um, yeah, we can do the analytics on a daily basis. Um, this is just something we've implemented. I won't talk too much about this, but this is also an interim measure for secure document sharing across all government departments, uh, similar to Dropbox, but this is hosted locally within our data center. So the concerns about cloud and security in the cloud and so on are addressed from that perspective. And of course, Microsoft Teams for collaboration, document sharing at the back end, because um, yes, while we talk about public facing services, the, at the back end, uh, we need to move um, documents and improve processes and collaboration and communication internally within the public sector as well. Lessons learned, it's my last slide. Um, um, this is this is not this is just a random set of lessons learned, observations from what we have done and what I've spoken about so far. A citizen-centric approach leads to greater service uptake. So we come to government also often very times our policy makers may have a view of what people need, but you know what people really need when you deliver service and you see great uptake. Uh, I mentioned our driver's license launch, launch last week, and it's been tr a tremendous response because this is a service that people really want. They don't relish the thought of having to stand in a line for hours uh, at two specific locations only to get their license. So that's something that's, uh, as long as you focus on what people really want, then that helps to drive um, the uptake of the service. Uh, be agile. <clears throat> the days of planning for a year and then implementing won't work. Um, 
you know, by, by the time you actually implement requirements have changed anyway. So just have some short term deliverables. We I talked about the forms.gov that we implemented while we waited for the full e-services platform um, because it just was this severe demand for government services, uh, digital government services now. Be mindful of policy changes within the public sector. Often we talk, we, we know that we've been implementing a program for some time. There's a change in government and we sort of want to continue down a certain path. But if there's a shift in policy or shift in direction, then we need to be mindful of that and focus on the new initiatives that have uh, been proclaimed. Uh, Multi-stakeholder collaboration helps. We have established, I saw a question in relation to whether these systems are tested before they go online. We've established a multi uh, a cyber security working group, which is a multi-stakeholder uh, group. It, uh, we have members from the private sector, the banking institutions, uh, public sector, NGOs, and so on that help us in terms of our cyber security policies, in terms of reviewing applications, in terms of giving us guidelines, and so on. It's, it's really a watchdog group that understands the need. They're all cyber security professionals. They understand the need to deliver secure public services. Um, the hackers, of course, never sleep. And so every time you'd have to you deliver a service, that has to be at the forefront of your mind. We have a telecoms working group and a digital identity working group. Again, all across all sectors, um, NGOs, we have disabled community because we want to ensure that the services we deliver online are also um, are also friendly in terms of are accessible in terms of persons with disabilities. Uh, public education and awareness essential. There's a culture change that needs to happen within the within Barbados and certainly within the region as well in terms of the uptake of digital services. Uh, digital services are not new. Online banking systems are not new, new, but the banks will tell you a majority of their customers still come into the bank even though they can pay a bill online. Uh, so this is a sort of a cultural or a mental shift that we need to make. Uh, the upskilling, reskilling of public officers is critical as well. Uh, because they themselves have to adopt. Re-engineering is critical. Uh, we can't look at, anytime we go to look at a new service, we have to, as the, our prime minister calls it, deconstruct it. Uh, is it relevant at all in this, uh, in 2020? Um, and should we just break it apart and ask a new question? If I had to deliver this in a new way, how would I do it? Rather than looking at existing processes and just digitize those. I mentioned cybersecurity and the need for capacity building within the public sector. Leadership at the highest levels, that speaks for itself. Infrastructure, that Bennett mentioned that. We have very good infrastructure in terms of fiber in the, re in the region that was tested uh, during the COVID and the remote work, uh, the work from home initiatives. And I think it stood up, uh, for my, my own experience, it stood up pretty well, but we need to move forward on things. I think they were mentioned yesterday in the, in the CIGF, uh, persons like Bevel Wooding and so on would have mentioned the need for ASNs and IXPs and for um, caching services that, that, that allow us to build more resilient and reliable networks, not having to go out to North America to get back to a service. And that is one of the things I've been pushing for um, because there is the demand, yes, for cloud services because we can spin up infrastructure more quickly but then what does that do to our own efforts to build uh, solid regional infrastructure? And so there is that trade-off in terms of, yes, the cloud is there and most of it is hosted in North America, Europe and so on, but we need to build, I don't think that citizens should have to go to North America to access local services. And I think that is, that is something we need to focus on. Digital is critical, and this is my last point. It is not a nice to have uh, services. There are some services that simply could not be delivered unless it was a digital uh, environment. So I mentioned the driver's license. This is not something, okay, it's nice to have it online. No, if you, if you don't have it online in some cases in this pandemic, you just will not be able to offer it at all. And so this heightens the imperative for us to move forward with our digital initiatives. And on that note, I want to thank you for your attention. Well, thank Here's you very that. much. Thank you very much, Rodney. And um, I think I, I, I love that last point you made, digital is critical. I think that's a, a very useful, I think I'm going to steal that catchphrase from you, digital is critical. That that's really um, sums it up. And I'm quite impressed with what Barbados is doing, like Dominica, 
um, quite a lot of um, work being done, both from the standpoint of policy. Um, you're seeing a lot of multi-stakeholder efforts, you know, committees and, and task forces being set up. And of course, we are seeing quite um, a heavy emphasis on transactional services. Um, Barbados obviously has a, their payment system working well for them. They have all of their backend um, accounting in place. They're able to see all of their transactions. And I'm saying that because in some countries, and I'm going to be um, hint, hint to my own self, Tran Tobago, we are still not there yet in terms of our um, financial environment on the government level where it's all um, online and able, able to be fully transparent and able to do analytics. So that's highly important for that to um, move forward. Um, given the time, and I'm not seeing any specific questions for Rodney yet. So what I can do is we can roll the questions up um, to the right to the end. Perhaps what you can do is add some questions in the chat now for Rodney or in the Q&A box if you have them directly and Rodney can try and answer them as well as for Bennett if you still have questions. And once um, Maurice has completed with his presentation, we can probably take um, a more open approach to it. Um, we'll have Maurice field some questions first and then perhaps everyone thereafter. Um, so I don't want to do Barbados that, but I did want to give Bennett and Dominica since the, 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 the country of Dominica is not often put on the, the, the world stage like this. So um, I think it was great to have Dominica answer some questions live. So with that, I'm going to then ask Maurice if he's ready to um, share his screen. Thank you, Maurice. And go right ahead. Maurice is the CEO of EGOV Jamaica. And let's hear from what Jamaica is doing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing well in this new norm of this COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so um, I, you know, fellow panelists, were two very good presentations. Um, albeit, you know, Jamaica as well, we all seem to be having, you know, same common, common problems, um, which we need to tackle. Um, certainly, you know, within the region. Um, so for my presentation this morning, I'm not going to delve too much into some of the existing online services and rather just focus on a particular case study um, coming out of this um, COVID pandemic, which has allowed us to move even faster in terms of our transitioning um, to a digital uh, government. All right, so just to get started, um, just to tell you, you know, before this pandemic started, Jamaica has, was on a, on a journey in terms of moving from e-government to digital government. And um, this, what you're seeing on screen, basically just gives an idea as to the direction that we're taking. Um, coming up from the bottom, we have what we're looking at as in terms of governance and um, leadership, Etc. We have Eagle of Jamaica Limited, which is the, the, the government company which I had here um, under the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology. We also have an office of a chief information officer, which also resides in that ministry, which focuses more on policy standards um, in ICT, while e government Eagle of Jamaica Limited our primary focus is on implementation of ICT services and solutions. Um, we, we passed a law which would see the establishment of an ICT authority, which basically will combine these two entities into one and will be headed by the CIO of the government. Um, that work to transition to this new authority is now currently in place and it will see the focus of ICT and the digital agenda coming out of this ICT authority, which will you know, add a, a greater level of governance, a greater level of focus and coordination in terms of working with all the different ministries, departments and agencies um, across the government of Jamaica in leading the transformation. From an infrastructure point of view, 
We have been rolling out for a few years now a island-wide um, fiber optic network, um, which will interconnect basically the entire government and also extend that to the security forces, health centers, hospitals, schools, etc. And this is even seen more critical now in, in, in this time. Um, and they are actually plans afoot to, to sort of accelerate the rollout of this, of this network. Um, and I noticed, you know, Rodney spoke about, you know, the use and inclusion of um, cloud infrastructure. And I also too, I'm of the belief that, yes, there are crowd services out there which can be accessed, but we still need to look at our own local build-out of infrastructure. Um, I will speak about a particular application, because as we know it right now, accessing services certainly over the internet, sometimes we have local content here, and we, and we have a situation where that information or the, you know, the connectivity has to be over to the internet, possibly to the US, UK, and then it comes back into your country just to access local resources. So it is very important that you do have some local infrastructure because you're talking about saving in terms of cost, performance, especially at a time like this where um, we are now using um, the Zoom platform here, for example. And um, you know, so a lot of these connections will have to go outside of the country to come back into the country just to feed you with services, certainly as persons utilize it locally. Um, Zoom does provide for a, a local connector to, to actually establish a sort of a local connection, but you still have to access to for the meeting management. So it is very important that you have some capabilities and probably you know augment that with the, the provision of, of cloud services as well. The so we have that GovNet project which is currently in train. Um, that is also supported by the IDB through uh, a, a loan, um, just over 10, 10 million which also includes the, an upgrade to our data center. So we, as part of the building out of our infrastructure capabilities, we'll have a um, data center for the, for the government of Jamaica, as well as its associated um, disaster recovery um, center as well. And this is primarily to, primarily to serve the, the entire um, government of Jamaica, all the ministries, departments, and agencies. We've also established a, a portal, which is supposed to be a one-stop shop for all government um, services, which will be placed online. Um, this is currently now being, being revamped and reimagined to, to focus not just on just providing links to the different websites, but to more focus on a full integrated platform. So we know the challenges and we've spoken about it in terms of fragmentation and each ministry departments tending to do their own thing, have their own gender, have their own roadmap. Um, you will go to one um, to access one service, let's say for example, for, for, for taxation and you have a username and a password to log in to access those services. If you also go to maybe a Ministry of Labor and Social Security for additional services, you also have another username and password. So what we want to move towards is one single sign-on. So you have, you know, you have your one single identity and you'll be able to, to access all the government's um, services and sites through one integrated platform. So some work is now being done on that. And as you can see, a, a unique national identification um, is, is critical to this sort of um, process and provision of these services. We have a national ID project um, in train. Um, as many persons will be aware that um, we had some challenges from the legal side in terms of the original law as it was, um, was passed. It was eventually ruled unconstitutional and um, the government will be going back to the, to the, to the, to the table with that. Um, nonetheless, the project is very much alive and well. I think it's far recognized that this is something that countries need to have um, in terms of being able to, to uniquely identify citizens and residents of your country. Um, we have quite a number of similar services. Um, you know, Barbados would have mentioned quite a few of them. We are 
what we don't actually have currently, we are, we are working on um, online taxes, e-filing for taxes, on, online payments. We have a, a payment gateway, um, which can be utilized by different ministries, agents, and departments for, for making payments for you know, services, fees, et cetera. We have a, a single window for trade system, which was recently implemented. Um, online company and business registration. We also have that in place. Um, we're also, you know, working on some other initiatives. Um, one, one such initiative is a, a e-participation um, platform, um, which will have a, a mobile app application as well to support that. That will be put in place so you know citizens can be better engaged. Um, with 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 government and allow for 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 club collaboration, the with the national ID system there will be a number of verification systems. We want to move similar to you know what Barbie just mentioned about the the whole once only principle. We're interacting with different government agencies and departments that information as provided to one agent and department, you will have to keep providing the same information as you traverse and do business with government. We want to be in a position where we can collect that data once. Um, just talk about interoperability and the ability to share data across ministries, departments and the agencies and even the private sector. We're also working on a, a similar framework. We call it the Jamaica Data Exchange platform. Um, it is somewhat similar to the X Road. It's something that we, we've actually built from scratch and um, that will be implemented sometime later this year. So as I promised, what I'm gonna do is sort of take us through a little journey as to one particular case, you know, having been faced with this pandemic and, and what it means in terms of provision of services to citizens of a country. Um, especially something that needs to be provided um, urgently and um, with, with some level of, of, of trust and reliability. So as many countries would have had, they would have some form of a care program um, coming from COVID-19 allocation of, of resources for, for employees and in some instances, employers. So this program came out of the Ministry of Finance. Jamaica experienced its first, um, recorded its first COVID case on March 10th, um, 2020. And from that time, you know, plans were put in place to say how it is that there could be some form of intervention or, or financial stimulus for persons who certainly would, not, would be placed at a, a massive disadvantage um, through, through job losses and having to deal with this pandemic at the time. So there were a number of things when, you know, when, when, when this team was put together and um, started deliberating how it is that can we go about to be able to get cash transfers to the citizens who most need it um, at a time like this. And, um, one of the first things, the first challenge, or one of the first things we thought about, how is it that we can uniquely identify um, the citizens of the country? In the absence of a national ID system, certainly there were different IDs in use. You would have a driver's license, a voter's ID, national ID. And, and it, for these particular IDs, and of, of course your passport, these IDs are there for specific purposes. So your driver's license is issued to you for, for to give you permission to, to drive on the road, passport for, for travel, um, and a voter's ID if you so would like to exercise your right to vote. Now, there, there are, in addition to just being able to uniquely identify you, we've also said that this particular program, this care program would have to be targeted to the most vulnerable persons who would have lost their lost their jobs, some persons who are unemployed, the elderly, et cetera. So not just being able to identify you, but we'd also be, be, would need to know in which one of these target groups you belong to. So it's really just not a matter of just having an ID. 
So we recognize that we'll also be faced with another challenge. Okay, so having been able to identify you, how much data on you does the government have or is your identification sufficient enough to give us the information that we'd want to, to, um, to utilize? Another challenge we had is, okay, so fine, having identified persons, and when we look at a space like this, we're in a pandemic right now, um, persons clearly would not be able to, to go to an institution, to go and register, to fill out a form, et cetera. How it is that we will be able to provide access to these persons for them to apply? And we're talking about, as I mentioned before, if we're looking about talking about vulnerable people here, elderly persons, would these people have access to an online platform? Will they have internet access based on the, their geographic location of their residence? Is there any form of um, access that would be provided there? We're talking about access to bandwidth or even just cellular service. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we think about when we talk about digital transformation. Um, if you don't stop to think, these are some of the things you need to be able to address before you can start even talking about technology and the implementation of technology. Other things um, we have also thought about is how to transfer the funds. How would these persons get these funds that they're so badly in need of, especially at this time, and not just to get it. We're talking about to get it in a very short space of time. The pandemic was here, um, business was brought to a halt, people were losing their jobs, people were being laid off, and you know it was very important and critical to be able to get funds to persons as quickly as possible. And um, for this conversation again, as I said, the, the, the urgency that has to be created. So we had to have some form of urgency that had to be created. And with this urgency, obviously, clearly, the way that we would have done things traditionally, there's going to be, have to be some form of modification. And this is really and truly would go to the heart of what is transformation. Because it's really about we needed to do something now that we've either never done before or we have to just try and do something differently. So having looked at some of these challenges, these are some of the solutions. Um, before I added, I just wanted to touch on three other things. Cybersecurity, because we're now in a space where as we move and migrate more and more services online, we can't just think about security as an afterthought now. All of this has to be part of your planning and design of any system that you put it online. So we had to look at things about it. If we put up such a system here and it's not even properly tested based on the time that we have, is it going to be vulnerable? It's the case that um, we're talking about um, finances, we're talking about money, we're talking about what are the risks that would be involved in it if a system like this was to be hacked and the persons who funds were intended to be transferred to, they weren't transferred to them. To talk about safety and security, safety in the sense that we're during a pandemic now and there are certain health protocols which are in place in terms of you know, social distancing, um, you know, wearing of masks, put persons in crowded spaces, etc. Um, there's also a security. If, if persons are going to know that persons are going to be collecting cash, is it the case where you know you have to exercise extra vigilance? Is there anything that the government can put in place to sort of mitigate against these particular challenges? And the performance of the application. So there would have been a lot of stories of systems which are online where persons go online and within a minute of going online to these websites, the system would crash. And that would be just about the end of that particular system because, and that's the thing, when you're talking about transformation and if you're introducing something new, that first experience that a user has is going to count and have a lasting impression. So you go on a site, if the site crashes and it doesn't work, chances are you won't go back. And we've saw, we saw that experience certainly in the United States where persons now had to move from going online to applying for these grants and they decided to stand in long lines 
waiting patiently in order to, to get through. All right, so having identified some of these challenges, and um, some of these challenges, by the way, would not have been identified upfront because as you delve more and more and you start working and you start implementing, then you'll start seeing other additional um, challenges coming to the fore. And you just have to be in a position to be able to, to react quickly and go back and refine. Um, this is not something which is typical of government, but as we move into this digital era, digital space, agility is going to be very important. So it cannot be seen as the norm of government, government moving slow, et cetera. What citizens are demanding of governments now is that there is, once there is feedback, you can take that feedback, and put it back into your system, make the adjustments accordingly and get back to them. So in terms of our different solutions, what we recognize is that, okay, in the absence of an ID, we, for persons who were formerly employed, and filing their, their returns, the, the tax administration of Jamaica would have them on record. And they would have been identified by their, 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 their tax ID or their tax registration number, which we commonly call TRN here. So we have, having established that, we could say that for persons who would be targeted, who were employed and would have lost their jobs, then we would know these persons by their TRN. So the TRN cost then that would be sufficient to be able to identify them or for them to sort of raise their hand and say, I want to participate in this program. This is my TRN. So that was one of the problems that was solved immediately. TRN, again, it is one of the most widely used numbers currently. Um, so even if you're not formally employed, you utilize your TRN when you're doing business with the government of Jamaica. So if you want a driver's license, you'll need to have a TRN. If you're going to pay taxes, you need to have a TRN. So we could recognize that even outside of persons who were employed or formerly employed, the TRN would still be a candidate to be able to identify someone, um, pensioners, et cetera. So that the choice, it was the only logical choice at that time to move and go with the TRN in the absence of a national ID. And ID. Um, I'm sorry there. Now, the, the other thing is that if we're talking about um, an estimated, let's say, you know, half a, half a million persons who would possibly apply, to this particular system for these grants, to have staff in place to be able to process these applications, it would be almost impossible and given the time. So it is clear that from the start that this had to be a fully digital system, fully automated as, as, as much as possible. And uh, that was one of the design goals that to be able to, to, to validate and verify a person in terms of who they are, and which will be done through their TRN, that had to be automatic. In terms of the eligibility for a particular grant, that also would have to be um, automated. And to make the payouts, that also would have to be automated because there's just no way you could have enough manpower to be able to coordinate and to effect this particular program just utilizing human resources alone. So it was clear that there would have to be some coordination and collaboration between different agencies across government. Um, we would have tax administration exists. They are collecting data in terms of um, your, 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 your current tax status, whether you're employed, et cetera. Um, it also has some other demographic, um, well, has some other personal information in order to uniquely identify, so, you know, such as your name, your date of birth, as well as your ID, which could be used to uniquely identify you. Uh, we wanted to stay away from manual intervention as much as possible. And this, one of the other reasons is also for transparency. Um, there should not be seen that, you know, there's one person will get a particular grant over the other or before the other. Um, because someone knows you. Um, 
and having a fully automated system will allow that to, to, to improve and increase that trust factor with the, with, the, with the particular system as well. The, the payments as well um, would, would need to be automated. So we have to find a way that how it is that we're gonna get funds to, 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 to individuals. Another thing that we looked at is in terms of reach and access, and I mentioned that, how is it that you're gonna apply? Yes, you have um, laptops, computers, but the mobile penetration in, in Jamaica is very high. Um, I think it's probably um, almost, I would say 1.5 mobile devices per person um, in the population right now. Um, but that still doesn't mean that persons who have access to a mobile device will have access to to a data plan for data. And one of the things that we, the government utilized is in collaboration with the telecommunications providers to allow a zero rated access to this particular application. So this was done. Um, so in the absence of having a, a data plan on your phone, you'd still be able to, to, to access the service and to be able to apply for these grants. As far as the security is concerned, what we did we also recognize that this is something for Jamaicans here. And just to reduce the risk of having to deal with, you know, denial of service attacks or just general hacks, we, we, we sought to block access to the system um, from outside, from out island in terms of IP addresses. So that was also part of it. So that would actually reduce and lessen the load on this particular system. Um, by just restricting it to the to, to local um, IP addresses. The, the other thing that we did was that in terms of designing the forms, and I think Rodney spoke to this, that digital transformation is really not about taking existing forms and then converting them to an online form. You need to look at the entire process. You need to take a specific look. So I'll tell you, the first round of the application form for this grant, um, some of the forms was in excess of six pages. Of, and I'm talking about um, the, the legal sheet you know, of, 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 of information that was being requested in order to determine if someone would get a grant or not. And um, you know, it was impressed upon the team that, listen guys, we have to remember that if there's information that government has on these persons, we should not be asking them for that information. In addition, we should not be asking for information which is not going to be utilized in determining whether a grant is going to be given or not. So it's not a case where, yes, because we have a form now, we're gonna seize the opportunity to try and collect as much data about persons as possible. Um, and that's not the purpose of this. And, and it shouldn't be the case that, you know, persons would have to be given information which is not going to be utilized for the purposes of which. We now have a data protection law in place. The data protection law speaks to things like this in terms of how data is collected, the purpose that it is used for, et cetera. So even with that in mind, we took the decision that we would all we'd contact, collect the minimum information required. And in context, collecting the minimum information, what this also does, it improves and increases the experience for the user in terms of how quickly one can apply um, by just giving the minimum information and um, just leading to an overall better experience and interaction with the application. The application, basically we, for simplification, it's easy as a one, two, three, so we wanted to get something that would be along those lines, just three steps. One, who you are, how would you like to receive a payment, and the final screen, confirm the information that you've, 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 you've submitted. And it was as simple as that. You put in your name, your identification, and, 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 um, and your you know, date of birth or something, which certainly you would know. And that gets validated in real time your application is accepted and um, you're given a confirmation as to, as to the, um, the receipt. The, the other thing that came out is that we recognized again, 
we did not, the, 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 the issue that we had about persons in terms of access and the whole digital divide is that we put, built a system that would allow not just you, the person who is applying, but anyone could apply on your behalf. So it wasn't necessary that you were applying, that you'd have to go on and create a username or create a password um, to remember a password to come back. We allow the system that once you have the information on the person who is applying for the grant, you can just put that information in and the applications will be accepted. Because at the, at the end of the day, when the payments were going to be made, if it's associated with a bank account or if it's associated with, with a remittance company in which we gave that option, is that it has to go to the account in the name of the person who is applying. Or if you're collecting by, by a remittance, the person who's collecting the funds must be the same name, reference number, et cetera, as, the, as what the application is. So that would have mitigated against the possibility of, of that kind of fraud. And we, we allow the system to be more or less open. So, and what you found is that persons now in different communities, they set up uh, like an internet cafe and was now accepting um, persons to come in to, 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 to apply on their behalf. You know, um, and, Maurice, Maurice yeah? uh, we, we have very little time left. Um, okay. So, yes. so I'll, I'll just quickly jump. So lessons learned. Coming out of this, we recognize that Yes, we're building systems with, with um, payment options, but we realized that there was really um, an issue of financial inclusion, um, where there are lots of persons who didn't have bank accounts, et cetera. And certainly solutions we need to look at now are things like mobile money, e-wallets, et cetera. Um, true national ID, um, we spoke about that a lot in terms of you know, implementation of a national ID which will allow the government to be able to identify uniquely each and every citizen. Customer support was another thing that we had to tackle. And um, the customer support, we recognize, you know, having call centers, et cetera, we'd want to utilize more artificial intelligence, more emerging technologies to assist with that. Notifications through the use of SMS and text messaging, again, another critical aspect in terms of keeping that link and communication between the citizens and, and the government is a very useful tool. And of course, last but not least, user-driven design. Implement designs which suit the users um, and have those tested. Because that is where you're gonna get the maximum take up. And I think that point was given before. And just to end, for me, I've always said digital transformation is about governance culture and change, and change management enabled by the appropriate use of digital technology. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Maurice. And um, it does appear, however, that we are at 10.30. So I've noticed that there's a question in the Q&A chat box, Maurice, for you from Albert Daniels. Perhaps you could uh, answer the question for him in the chat in the Q and A box. Um, so he's asking about DNSSEC in relation to security layer for the online cash transfer system in Jamaica. Um, in the interest of time, and uh, we have we have run out of, run out of time. I'm going to ask if there are any additional questions. Perhaps um, you can put that into the chat, and perhaps the panelists can answer them directly here and in the Q and A box as well. Um, I'd like to thank my panelists um, in reverse order, Maurice Barnes, for a very interesting and detailed presentation on what's going on in Jamaica. I really did appreciate that walkthrough of the, the cash transfer um, solution that you've uh, implemented, as well as your overall methodology and, and approach for what Jamaica is doing. Um, thank as well um, Rodney Taylor for showing us a really good um, snapshot of what's, what's, what a small island developing state in the Caribbean can do um, with, with its resources to deliver e-government and some of those lessons that are learned there. And as well as, as Dominica, which is our smallest and, and um, clearly most, um, I guess, res resource trap member and showing what, what really is possible um, in the face of, you know, 
recovering from something like a disaster, as well as going forward with um, a, a World Bank approach to, to driving digital transformation in their economy, as well as a wider OECS approach. So I'd like to thank um, Bennett, Rodney, and Maurice for their wonderful presentations and their, their insights, as well as the participants who joined us this morning um, and we're whatever time zone in from all of the world for a really um, useful and certainly very productive um, presentation and interaction engagement today. And I believe uh, when Nigel gets on, we, the CTU will be sharing the presentations thereafter. So with that, I'm Tracy Hackshaw. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. And I'm going to hand back right now to Nigel um, for, any, uh, for any additional thoughts on this and certainly to move on to the next session at the Caribbean IGF 2020. Thank you.